Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you to uh, our gracious hosts. And most of all, thank you very much for coming in this evening and taking some of your time uh, to, uh, to talk. The title of my, uh, my talk tonight is Charting America's Course, Assessing the Position and Progress of the United States. That's a big idea. Sounds complex. What I'm going to be talking about is the opportunity to do one very common sense thing. If you had to sit down right now and try to answer the question, is this country going in the direction that you want it to? And you had to use numbers to make your case. Which measures would you choose? And if you chose a good set of measures, could you get them up on the web in a way that 200 million Americans could use them? And use that tool to start to figure out whether we really got things in balance, whether we're going the right direction or not. That's the idea. It's more complex to implement than it is to explain. Uh, but we're going to talk enough about it today that I think you'll get a sense uh, of not only why we need to do it and what it is, I'm also going to show you on the web for about 20, 25 minute demo what it looks like if you turn the switch on tomorrow. So you're going to get some very detailed, specific information and measures on the web of what this would look like, and then talk a little bit about what the ultimate impact uh, will be for all of us as Americans. From my perspective, to be an American is to believe in progress. It's in our most sacred covenant, the Constitution, to form a more perfect union. It's in our culture. We want to see results. It's a deeply held value. We want to leave the world a better place for our kids. And it's in our creed. Anyone should be able to make something of themselves, of themselves in our society. It's our ideal that America has something special to offer to each of its citizens as well as the rest of the world. A century and a half ago, Abraham Lincoln addressed measuring progress when he wrote a common sense words which ring as true today as they did then. If we could first know where we are and whither we're tending, we would better judge what to do and how to do it. As we move further into this century, the nation is at a crossroads. Let's stop for a moment right here and now, take a step back and survey the landscape together so we can learn how to take the right steps forward on the right course to the right destination. And we really got, we have to pause now collectively as a nation, move to higher ground and look for some landmarks because I believe we're in danger of getting lost. We, the American people, are simultaneously working harder than ever, keeping the faith hopeful, but also struggling, afraid, confused, frustrated, angry, and most of all, disoriented. We muster our signature courage, determination, ingenuity, and resilience in the face of an increasingly uncertain future. Meanwhile, we're trying to make sense of it all. Fit everything in when the line between work and home has become blurred. Security and stability are a distant memory. And finding meaning in our life has become ever more important. So how are we doing at this balancing act? Are we making headway? Is the quality of life improving at home? Work with our health, our friends? our children's education when it comes to our finances, the security of our nation. If we're going to lead ourselves and our families, our fellow citizens, and the free world through the next century, it's time to reaffirm the need to chart and actually navigate our course as a nation to make sure our society is headed in the right direction and staying on track for a fact. And we can't kid ourselves any longer you can't manage what you can't measure, and no one is doing this for us. No one is doing this now. There's so much information, we're drowning in it. The media can't sort through it. Technology is not going to save us. Markets work, but the invisible hand is far from infallible. The government is not the answer. We have to learn to do this ourselves, together, and demand that our leaders join us in this kind of a challenge. I'm one American willing to admit right here loud and clear, what we all secretly know, but haven't said aloud, we do not have a way to know how we are really doing as a country, as a people. Senator Edward Kennedy said last year, not long before his passing, we used to be able to debate whether the glass was half empty or half full. 
now we've lost the glass. This is an unsustainable situation and an unparalleled opportunity to advance our democracy. We must simply apply the same standard to our nation that we apply elsewhere in life. As individuals, we track our weight and our blood pressure, our families watch budget and savings, businesses track profit and loss, even our churches and nonprofits track donations and participation, governments track taxes and performance measures to chart a course for the United States. We must simply choose and track key measures and then work to create a navigational tool that helps all Americans assess our progress. We need a key national indicator system. So first, let's get in the right mindset about this. We sit here together, be conscious of our many roles in life, sons and daughters, sisters and brothers, parents or grandparents, employees, professionals, educators and students, spouses, significant others, investors, consumers, followers, leaders, residents of this city, the state of Iowa, or citizens of this extraordinary country, the United States of America. Stop for a moment and just think and sit here as a complete human being and let's give ourselves some perspectives. Consider not just the pressing issues we face too often in the headlines, but take account of some of the deeply held personal dreams and aspirations that we far too seldom take the time to celebrate and nurture. Think of the past far behind us, the present here with us, and the future ahead of us. Remember, just for this moment, the achievements, sacrifices, and legacies and shortcomings of past generations, the extraordinary body of energy and talent alive in this very room at this very moment, and in the generations going forward. Open your mind, heart, and spirit. We're all struggling today to get ahead and get through each day, but we must pause and re-examine. Measuring is actually so second nature to us that we often take for granted what a meaningful activity it is. When we measure, we specify, we quantify what we value most. Behind every seemingly abstract statistic, a chart or a graph are real people and stories. In the medical profession, there's a saying, favorite saying, behind every number there's a tear. Behind all these numbers we're going to be talking about their tears or smiles, a suffering or a thriving child, a struggling family, a small business taking off or one going under, someone who walks home from a night whistling or who's afraid on the streets, a broken or a vibrant community, someone who's just gotten or lost a job. If we can't learn how to chart a course together now, then our struggles will increase and we risk failing, falling further and further behind the curve. The stakes are too high, our quality of life, the time is short, we're already behind and resources are scarce, getting scarcer. Just look at the systemic risks that have revealed themselves with a surprising, shocking frequency. Systemic risks in our financial system, recession, in our health system, obesity, pandemics, housing, the mechanics of the mortgage crisis, families and community, cohesion in response to religious issues, the environment, climate, security, terrorism. I say no more surprises. We're better than this. James Madison, one of our founders' words, sort of echo through the ages for me, for he said, a popular government without a popular information or the means of acquiring it is a, but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy or perhaps both. We must create a new source of popular information or risk a farce and face the prospect of even greater tragedy. If we do this together, then nothing is beyond our capacity as a people. We must step forward on the only sure path to our future, choose our direction, and make it happen. So we need a shared frame of reference, a scorecard, to measure the USA's progress. We've got to look at holes, not just parts, and look at what's really important. Find the 80-20, the 80% 80 that we can agree on, Debate the rest, not let the perfect be enemy, the enemy of the good. And get started and get on the same page. As the noted social scientist Fred Mosteller famously said, it's easy to lie with statistics. It's a lot easier to lie without them. We need to focus on fewer measures, the best quality data available for, from either public or private sources, 
and make them much, much easier for lots of people to use up on the web. Achieving excellence, and as Americans, we must demand nothing less, requires agreeing on how to define our success. With access to the best available data, free, and access 365 24-7. We have the responsibility, the right, and the ability to assess the progress of the nation for ourselves. And everyone needs to participate. Individuals that are leading in our society, citizens, government agencies, philanthropies, corporations, media, academia. And this navigational tool, this scorecard, is within reach. The State of USA, which I represent, is part of a historic national effort to build a key national indicator system. It's the law, law of the land now since March 2010, and it's an oasis of bipartisanship in the current political environment. It has diverse private sector philanthropic support, Carnegie, Rockefeller, Gates, Hewlett, a bipartisan national commission, which is just being assembled, the Senate has already made their appointments, and the prestigious National Academy of Sciences and its operating arm, the National Research Council are on point. The $70 million authorization over nine years. This effort is going to make it possible for all of us to assess progress using a common scorecard that represents new common ground. Now you might ask yourself, is this really possible? It's not only possible, it's happening. I'm going to show it to you today, a quick early preview, although there are still many hurdles to overcome. Everything I'm showing you on the web today is either live or ready to go live. And we'll give you a very concrete demonstration of how you and all of us can take back the task of assessing this country's progress and charting our course into the future. It's important to say that this national effort started on the local level 20 years ago and has grown and evolved to include millions of our fellow citizens around the country who have already started doing it. A movement of Americans that has been slowly but steadily building since 1989 in over 100 neighborhoods, cities, counties, regions, and states all over this country. Pittsburgh, Chicago, Boston, Silicon Valley, Virginia, Jacksonville County, Florida, Baltimore, the list goes on. You can go to our website, they're all here. These key indicator systems cover jurisdictions that re represent a very large portion of the American public already which means that in all these areas there's a place to get involved at the state or local level and there's a foundation and growing momentum to support a key national effort. This is a quiet revolution of citizens that have already taken their collective fate into their own hands and finding new ways across sectors to define, measure, communicate about, and advance their progress. As far as I'm concerned, it's another in a long line of American revolutions and now it's arrived at the national level. So how are we going to make this work? Ask hard questions and assume nothing. We should ask tougher questions of ourselves and of our leaders based not, on just, just, not just on what we believe but what we know, not just what we know but what we can know collectively, not just what we know collectively but what we can measure specifically, and not just what we can measure but what we can't measure or what we're now mismeasuring. Let's take an example. So get ready for a show of hands. I'm going to first read out three questions and then ask you to raise your hands in response to these questions. This will be the only audience participation exercise tonight until we do Q&A in about 25 minutes. So three questions are, how many of you think that the USA is generally on the right course? How many of you think the USA is generally on the wrong course? How many of you are unsure? So first question. How many of you think the USA is generally on the right course? Raise your hand. 15, 20. How many of you think the USA is on the wrong course? Maybe 30, 40, 50. How many of you are unsure? Yes! <laughs> now, here's what's so amazing about that. The majority of you are unsure. Now just think about this. Over a dozen different organizations, national organizations, have done some version of this poll for the last 15 years. And right or wrong, whether people answer right or wrong varies from the high 60s to the low 30s. And it crisscrosses back and forth depending on how the country's doing. 
But what's consistent over all that time period is only 5% of the respondents are unsure. <laughs> now, I'm missing something, but are we really so sure of ourselves? I think we just got the answer. If you really stop to think about it, we're not that sure of ourselves. We should be more skeptical of assessments, opinions, and arguments without solid facts, more tolerant of good questions without answers, and do the hard work of figuring out what's right to measure. We're just not yet focused on the right measures or the right tools, and in many cases, we're measuring through a rear view mirror rather than looking forward. Now let's start to dig in and take some examples. Are we focused on the right economic measures? I'm skeptical. GDP is an important number. The difference between the region's over one million in population that produce the highest GDP per capita, Silicon Valley at 82,000 and San Bernardino at 22,000 is about 4X. But GDP has limits like every measure and Nobel laureates like Joe Stiglitz and Amartya Sen and Daniel Kahneman are telling us we rely on it too much. If we look at one of the measures they suggest to balance out our assessment of progress, median income, our growth picture over the past few decades looks substantially different. Since 1968, GDP has grown 120 percent, it's that blue set of circles, while family median income has grown 38 percent and household median income 25 percent. Are we focused on the right health measures? I'm skeptical. The Institute of Medicine at the National Academy sorted through hundreds of measures to do just 20 that we ought to concentrate on to assess our nation's health. Outcomes, behaviors, the key drivers, and health systems. Now here's a chart that you might see in the newspaper or a magazine. Life expectancy at birth for the U.S., a key measure of results increasing over almost 50 years, from 70 to 77. The U.S. is this red line, but still the lowest of the G7 countries compared to 82 for Japan. I wouldn't sneeze at five years. That's a pretty big number difference, but most media do not present this information in a way that many more Americans can discover something meaningful, understand and assess progress, and then widely share their point of view. So what we've created on the web is, first of all, multi-layered, so that you can look at the time series. If you want more information, you can click on these tabs and get more in-depth views on what's behind the numbers. It's multi-form in the sense that you could either use this data on the visualization, you could click through it and go directly to the source data from the OECD, Or alternatively, you can download the data for yourself. Put it in a spreadsheet, work with it yourself. It's multidimensional. We show time series. We give the users an opportunity to slice it by demography. And also, where possible, international, national, state, or regional comparisons. And it's also multi-use in the sense that once you've found something or discovered something, you can comment on it. You can email this widget. Uh, you can embed the code anywhere in a Twitter feed, in a Facebook feed. You can move it around the web. So when you discovered something, you can tell a million of people about it, or you can tell a thousand people about it, or you can tell someone uh, using the web. This, the capability to build this kind of a widget is what we've created. And once you choose a key measure and put good data behind it, then you could create something very infectious. Now, Part of the Institute of Medicine recommendations included the idea that healthy behaviors drive a majority of health outcomes. Some research says up to 80% of health outcomes are driven by six healthy behaviors. So let's see how states compare on these key drivers. Since we're in Iowa, let's take a look at Iowa. So 
So Iowa is near the top in excessive drinking and teen condom use. And around the median in physical activity, smoking, and obesity. Interpret it how you will. Those are the numbers. If you want to dig deeper, you can dig deeper by going in and looking at the rankings and slice them by demographic groups. So how does this all add up? What bang are we getting for our buck compared to other nations? Well, OECD comparable countries, which are re represented by these circles on this chart, were all together in 1960 on per capita health spending and life expectancy. Over the years, they followed different courses. The U.S. had life expectancy of 70 and a per capita expenditure of 149 in 1960. In the next 25 seconds, you're going to watch what happens over about 40 years. The U.S. ultimately diverges, increasing its cost per capita on health while staying roughly equivalent in life expectancy. So that in 2006, life expectancy had risen to the 77 years with a per capita health expenditure of $6,900. You wonder why we had a national health care debate. Are we focused on the right measures in competitiveness? the state of our families, youth and children, innovation, infrastructure, energy. I'm skeptical, but as you can see, there are many good places to start. The many paths we can chart together depend on the issues we frame and the measures we choose and if we can create this navigational tool. I believe it'll be more than worth the effort. Better frame problems and priorities, increased understanding of what we know and don't know, what works and doesn't work, more informed choices, and improved allocations of scarce resources. Above all, we will and we must move beyond partisanship to problem solving and beyond politics to progress. So what does assessing the progress of the USA actually mean in practice? Well, all navigation, uh, no matter how complex, starts with a basic question. Where are you now and where have you come from? Usually this involves the geography of space, point A and point B. We must create a geography of change geography of destiny. And we can use a key national indicator system to assess where we are and where we've been and whether we're really getting where we want to go at the right pace. Assessing progress means a key national indicator system must address the true, true meaning of the word nation as we understand it here in the U.S. A republic with limited central government, separation of powers, federated and market-based. But it also must take a citizen's eye view. For one day, we might want to use the system as a resident of Iowa City, and the next day we might be interested in how the country as a whole is doing. Let's take crime. Well, at the national level, as you'll see from this chart, the four main types of violent crime have dropped from over 700 per 100,000 people in 1990 to less than 500 in 2009. The picture looks much different, however, when you look at the city level. Let's take a look at national rankings for murder. Baltimore's at 37. The bottom of the list is Honolulu at two. Let's take a look at rape. Cleveland leads the list with 98. Miami's at 10, 9x difference. Assault, Cleveland, once again at the top, 878. El Paso is at the bottom of the list, 74. Assessing progress also means understanding connections, like the connection between education, jobs, and income. This is a visualization <clears throat> that shows the relationship between median income and educational attainment over time. And the latest data show that median income for those with a master's degree or above, good thing you're here in the room, 56000 a year is twice that of the median income for those with less than high school, 23000 a year, something every parent and child needs to know. Assessing progress also means choosing what's good news and bad news. There are no right answers here. Every one of us has our own interpretation. On the one hand, 
take an example in the environment. According to a widely used air quality index, the quality of America's air has improved using the measure of the number of days per year with an AQI over 100. From a high of 9% in 1999 to 3% 2008. On the other hand, if we look at CO2 emissions, these major countries, the U.S. is still producing CO2 emissions per capita at a rate that is among the highest in the world. In 2007, the U.S. produced the highest per capita output at 5.2 metric tons, a factor of 10x greater than India at 0.39. Assessing progress also means looking at the U.S. in the context of the globe. We are tightly interwoven in a global economy and society, and when it comes to national security, this is especially true and especially hard to measure, and especially hard to measure in public. But here's one way. It's so easy that the 11-year-old daughter of one of my colleagues used it at school the day after we produced it. You can assess for yourselves just how secure you think the U.S. is given the existing chemical, biological, and nuclear profiles of 30 key nations out of a global total of about 200. Here's an example of a profile. Assessing progress also means looking at who's doing well and who's not whether they're closing disparities based on age, race, and gender. Most of us probably know that women still make less than men on average in the workforce. But let, let's look at progress in the 25 to 29 age group on closing disparities in educational attainment and median income. Since 1980, women have steadily outpaced men in degree attainment. but they still lag significantly behind in median earnings. Now, assessing progress also means taking a long-term view, putting things in perspective. As a result of this recession, long-term unemployment is up significantly compared to previous recessions. Since 1969, the previous peak of median weeks of unemployment was 12, sorry, 21, no, 21. <laughs> but for this recession, it's nearly double that. Sorry, I'm at mean, not any median. Median is 12 and nearly double that at 25 in this recession, something we're all probably tired of hearing. Now, this and many of the, the measures we've looked at so far, growth and incomes, all have an influence on the issue of our federal government deficit. This is a serious and complex issue, but it's still possible with a little bit of effort to make it much more understandable for the American people. This tutorial, which takes about a couple of minutes to go through, explains what the deficit is. Where the money comes from. How to construct a deficit. Then it shows the absolute numbers over time. Makes the point that it helps to look at this as a percentage of GDP. Shows the adjusted numbers. Which puts things in perspective. How they're financed by debt and then how that debt is growing. So now you've had a look at the scorecard on the web. How do we chart America's course using a scorecard like this? This month, this year, this decade, this century? The future really is uncharted territory, you know. A ship of state and its people who do not have these navigational tools are at real risk. But the utility of a tool like this is determined not only by its design and construction, by the skill of those using it. Any measurement tool has real strengths and very real limits. 
Einstein actually expressed this idea very well when he said, everything that can be counted does not necessarily count. Everything that counts cannot necessarily be counted. And acknowledge, we've got to acknowledge that a key national indicator system will only do so much. It will focus on a limited number of measures. It won't be an encyclopedic database. It will be a navigational tool, but it's not going to choose our destination for us. It will be a single source, make it much easier for all of us to get at this data, but it's not going to collect original data. We'll disseminate information, but not interpret it. That's up to the, you and the media and the policy community and the research community. It will be relevant, but it won't set goals or targets. It will call out gaps in what we know, measures where we don't have data, where the data quality isn't good enough, but it won't fill those gaps. And it will try to earn a new level of trust, especially from the generation in the schools today, but it won't be a single source of truth. Nevertheless, a key national indicator system shifts an enormous amount of power back into your hands, the people's hands. It empowers us to ask key questions with an entirely new context. The answers to those questions become more significant with a key indicator system in place because it will be much easier to distinguish authenticity and accountability in how people answer them. We'll get out of this what we put into it. As President Ronald Reagan famously said, are you better off than you were four years ago? We must ask this question not just every four years, but every year, every month, every week, every day. Take our citizenship to a new level, to challenge our leaders at a new level, to take our society to a new level. What is the issue or opportunity you're trying to solve? What are the measures you use going to define progress? What's your baseline? Where's your starting point? What are your goals? By when? Do you have the right solutions? Are resources going to the right solutions? And based on your measures, are we actually making progress? So the bottom line, what will this mean for America? What could mean this, this mean for America? We can have a better understanding of what we do and don't know. And instead of having policy debates without being episodic, without perspective, without agreed upon metrics, we could involve millions of citizens in learning what's working and what isn't on a continuous, cumulative basis. Instead of how, our nation, how is our nation doing in fact being effect, ineffectively unanswerable, answers to this question would be possible for tens of millions of citizens. In the 1990s, the president of Harvard University wrote a book called The State of the Nation. It took him 10 years. With this kind of a tool, millions of us could put up a Facebook site or write a thoughtful paper in days or a week based on our own point of view on the state of the nation. So instead of youth being curious about society as a whole or skeptical or questioning, but without tools to understand, you can use these state-of-the-art tools and technology to enhance numeracy and raise bold new questions about where we can go. This is a real, real moment of truth, a difference we can make together. I really believe, having studied history and studied leadership, that great steps forward in history occur at moments when deeply held values are reaffirmed in the face of changing realities and unavoidable contradictions. Good citizens and great leaders grasp these moments, marshal resources, and act boldly to refresh and reinvigorate their societies. This moment's arrived for all of us. It's symbolized by the inspiration underpinning this event, and there will be concrete opportunities to contribute in workshops on Friday when you can say what you think is most important to measure about the state of the USA. We have to reaffirm the principle that an open, informed society take regular stock of how it's doing, but reinvent the means by which we accomplish it. The Constitution addresses measuring progress when it states, from time to time, the President shall present information on the State of the Union. That mechanism is necessary, but it is no longer sufficient for the 21st century. All of us must act on the frustration felt when we see people so confusion that hinders common aims and hear loud voices that revel in ignoring shared facts, make doubt their profession, and fear the product they sell. As citizens, we must grasp the power to think critically based on both values and facts about whether scarce resources are producing progress under effective leaders. And as stewards, whether parents or grandparents, 
We must demand a greater sense of collective accountability for our legacy. And if we all do this, then soon our generations will be able to be the first in history to look our sons and daughters in the eyes, to look each other in the eyes and say, we have finally learned how to know for a fact whether we are leaving the world a better place for you and future generations and to keep that from being a cliche, which is what it is right now. If you haven't already, join the Americans that have already embraced this 21st century endeavor. Take up the challenge of 21st century citizenship and use it to challenge authentic 21st century leaders. I look forward to traveling with you on this journey ahead. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much. And let's have some questions and comments so we can start a larger conversation here tonight.